Uh, no, you don't. You don't have people sort of choosing clothes for you. It's a bit like, you know, having someone get out and buy you a car. You know, so you can drive about town. It's a, it's a bit silly. Um, no, the, the clothes you tend to choose. It's just it's all down to how you feel that particular day. You know, you know, I've got a wardrobe full of sort of ridiculous outfits. One morning you wake up, you feel like a cowboy. So you're a cowboy for a day. You know? <laughs> or you know, you're, you're James Dean for an afternoon. It doesn't. It doesn't really matter. I think it just reflects. The clothes should reflect the, how you feel that particular moment. Mary Boyd from Main Home. When you're going on television, do you deliberately choose your clothes knowing that you're going to set off a fashion trend or is it just what you feel? Probably. Well, usually it's whatever's clean. Because, <laughs> 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 like, and also, usually when you're in a group, you're travelling about the country a lot, or different countries, and when you go on television like today, it's whatever's clean in your suitcase, usually. Well, very limited clothes range in the blue belt, I'm afraid. <laughs> Stuart, did you put on these boots today to set off a fashion trend? Um, no, I don't think I'll ever be a fashion for holy boots. You know what I mean? <laughs> yes, look, hole in the shoe. How did you decide in the name of the groups? Uh, Midge, Ultravox. Me? Uh, I'm glad to say I didn't. Ultravox already were called Ultravox when I joined them. But seemingly, the legend goes that uh, they, they decided on the name Ultravox because it sounded like a... Um, I don't know, like a piece of machinery or a, you know, a toaster machine. or a washing machine or something. Yeah. <laughs> exactly that, you know, like Hoover or you know, Electrolux or something. Is it? So it was, it was so that you didn't sound like any particular fashionable thing. You just sounded like a, you know, a plank of wood. Bobby? Um, we got it from a box of matches. <laughs> got these bluebell matches that was going back up to the time and uh, I just thought it was a good name. Did you have okay. any problems with that name? Yeah, we've had problems with lots of things. <laughs> <laughs> we, we got sued by um, the Bluebell dancers in Paris. It was a bunch of naked girls who sort of did high kicks. And uh, apparently there was some sort of confusion over us looking like them. <laughs> <laughs> so we had, we had to go to the Old Bailey, and um, the judge said that the very fact that we wore clothes and they didn't is enough, <laughs> enough of a difference. <laughs> Stuart Anson, why big country? Well, I could pick numerous reasons for this. Actually, it just came through through about a lyric writing, and it seemed something that was quite wide and expansive and pastoral and stuff. And I was quite Not excited about it. Aye, that's it. Mary Boyd from Main Home again. I hope to get some free fags. <laughs> <laughs> Do you Mary. think that by having a silly name, groups have more success? Bobby? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it helps if you've got a name that sort of like um, catches the public's imagination. But I think in the end, if uh, if you're too silly, no one takes you seriously. So I think it's more important that you have a good song. I think that every group's name tends to sound silly at first anyway, until you, get, you actually get used to listening to it. The jam sounds quite silly when you first mm. hear it, but it's, it, doesn't, it doesn't anymore. Aileen Mackay from Main Home. Do you think some people just go to pop concerts to scream and shout, or do you think they go to listen to I the band? <laughs> <laughs> I hope, hope so. I hope they come along to scream and shout. <clears throat> Mitch, how much is, I mean, do you think people should come to your concerts to listen to the music, or just enjoy themselves? I think most of the people who come to our concerts are, are geriatric anyway. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> that's, okay. no, that's, that's not quite fair. No, I'm sure uh, there's, there's points in any, any band set where... Um, it's time to sit and listen to the music. I mean, you can't really scream and shout during something like Vienna, I don't suppose. But there's, there's other points where people should get up and dance and enjoy themselves. But that, that, that's, all, that's all down to the band actually pacing the, 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 the performance. Bobby? I think they've got the records at home to listen to. I think they've got the concert. They should, they should get up and scream and shout, get drunk, pull girls. <laughs> Do you feel that visual effects and the whole stage show are important aspects of your music? Sure. Um, I don't know, I think that they, they help to enhance what, what you do live. They, they shouldn't be so, like, outstanding that they overpower what's actually happening on the stage, but it's nice to have something there that's, that, that you can use to illustrate certain songs during your set with. Up in the back there. Do you think concerts are just an excuse for drinks, drugs and sex? Where? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I, I think theirs might be, and if they are, I'll go there. <laughs> no, I, I, don't, I don't think it's that at all. Um, no, I think concerts, it's mainly it's for fans. It's mean, uh, you, know, you don't get, you know, 100,000 people in Glasgow will go to see, you know, an Ultravox concert or a Blue Bills concert or a Big Country concert. You'll get their particular fans going to see it, and they're going to enjoy themselves just to, to hear the music live and get the actual the, sort of the live buzz that they don't get when they're sitting listening to the record. It's like a it's, a, it's a form of worship, I suppose. They're enjoying it as much as we are. Do you feel responsible for your 
audience at concerts? Do you s like people end up fainting with the rush to the stage? Do you see all this when you're up on the stage? Yeah, you can do. Yeah, you, you can see quite a bit of it. But I'm glad to say it's that's calmed down quite a bit now. I think you might get that more in in sort of culture club or, or Duran Duran concerts than, than any of those. <laughs> being being old boys. Part of the excitement is that all that fainting and stuff and all that and screaming. I think when I was young and I went to see groups like T-Rex, I, I was quite into screaming. <laughs> you know, I, think, I think it's much more exciting. When you go to see groups these days, it's very easy to stand at the back and just and just be quite blasé about it because you've been seeing groups for so long. But I still remember the first time I seen groups and it was very exciting. Not so much now. Is there any particular aspect of the music business that annoys you? Quite a lot, actually. Um, is it the travelling and the press? I mean, don't mean I don't mean I like being in the papers, but I don't like talking to journalists or reading sort of like rubbish about yourself in the papers. That's, it's quite funny at the start, but then it gets quite annoying. And then the second thing is the very fact that it is very competitive, and I just like it to be fun. You know, I don't, I don't like the idea of like um, some other some groups crow about other groups failing, you know, or other groups' lack of success. I think it's more more fun to be concerned about yourself. More, I think it's too bitchy. Question up at the back there. Do you ever find that the media twist what you want, what you've said? Yeah, constantly, especially with papers like the Sun. <laughs> and the world. I mean, it's, it gets beyond a joke. The sun phone you up and asks you for a, for a quote, and you don't give them one, they say, well, I'm going to make it up, you know? <laughs> and next day they do make it up, and, and it, it is, it's quite funny the first few times, but eventually it gets embarrassing, because it affects the way your life goes a little bit, you know? So that affects the way that other people see you yeah, as well, exactly, and it affects yeah. the way people see your work. The most annoying aspect of, of, of being in the public eye, I suppose, is the fact that um, you're not allowed to switch off at any particular point. I mean, it, Anyone else who does a 95 job, they can go home and, you know, take their shoe off and sit and watch Coronation Street all evening or whatever. Well, you can't say Coronation Street, this is the BBC. <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 I mean, in, in the music business you can't do that. You're in the public eye, in the public eye all the time. And it becomes quite annoying having people finding out your phone number and phoning you up and, you know, in the middle of the night and you pick up the phone and they giggle down the phone. And, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that... <laughs> Oh, well, so it's been years. We'll talk about that later. Yeah. <laughs> Nicholas. Do you feel that too many of your decisions within a band get left to things like management or other rich businessmen in the music business? Uh, I think that's, that's all down to the, the individual and the band. Or that's all down to the bands, I suppose. I mean, I know for a fact that uh, Ultravox uh, get involved in just about every aspect of, of our careers. Um, and that goes from... Uh, choosing sort of roughly where we want to play when we're touring, uh, what sort of halls we want to play in, um, to directing the videos and, and taking a, a strong hand in our artwork and the pre presentation of the band in general. I think a lot of bands are quite guilty of just making a record and giving it to the record company and saying, okay, wrap that up like a tin of beans and sell it as many as you can in whichever way possible. You know. Do you think enough is done nowadays for new bands, especially in Scotland? Sure. Uh, I know exactly what you mean. I think sort of every group has to go through that, looking for rehearsal places and looking for, for like a chance to get gigs and things. We we try to do a bit by uh, using young Scottish groups as, as support acts and stuff, trying to help them get on. But apart from that, it's just it's just a matter of keeping your, your sort of nose to the grindstone, as it were. It's really I know how hard it is because I've been through it myself. Have you ever thought of leaving the music business? Um, I think uh, you know when you get to my time in life, I think. <laughs> I think everyone. <laughs> I think everyone uh, at times actually thinks it would be great just to sort of stop it all and go away and do something else. But then you've got to think, well, what else can I do? And it's not really that much. Obviously, there's there's uh, musicians are becoming more involved in things like production and, and and directing videos and whatever. So there's there's other areas to move into. But there isn't any one particular point where I thought I've got to stop. You know, I've got to. I've just got to give it up. How about after Slick? Did you think, think then that you might not make it anymore? Uh, yeah, yeah, even during Slick, I thought I might not make it. <laughs> it was. Uh, money, I think, in groups. Yeah. Like, being a football player, you're always worried about a broken leg, and as a football player, I think in the group, you're always worried about a, a flop LP or a flop two. It could, it could kill you dead straight away. Question up the back there. Stuart, what would you have done if you hadn't gone into the music business? Um, I'd have probably been a, an environmental health officer, because <laughs> <laughs> that's what I was before. I, before I started playing seriously. Either that or went to university or become an Arctic explorer or something like that. <laughs>